G'day folks, Troy Dean here and welcome to another episode of the WP Elevation podcast, the show where we help you start and grow your very own digital agency. And this week is a slight departure from our usual topic. My feature guest this week is Annie Wright, who is a licensed psychotherapist and coach from the Bay Area in Northern California from Evergreen Counseling. Annie, welcome to the show. Hi, Troy. Thank you so much for having me. Now, uh, a little bit of context as to why we have a licensed psychotherapist and coach on our show when when usually the guests on our show are in the marketing space or the web design space. Uh, so just a little bit of context for our listeners uh, I and, and how we connected. I was doing some research recently for a presentation and the point I was trying to make in this presentation is how the words that you uh, the words that you hear, or in, in fact, more explicitly, the words that you say to yourself uh, can, I believe, can impact your thoughts and therefore impact your beliefs and therefore your actions and your overall kind of well-being. And I went researching online, as you do, and through the power of the internet, I found this fantastic article on your website called uh, Neuroplasticity. And the pull quote was, speaking more kindly to yourself uh, helps because neuroplasticity. And so I went down the Annie Wright rabbit hole of learning about neuroplasticity and uh, and used your, your article in that presentation to prove my point and reached out to you on Facebook Messenger and said, hey, I love this article. I'd love to have you on the podcast. And here we are. Here we are. So tell me, how did you first get interested? A uh, little bit of context for people. You're a licensed psychotherapist and coach. My wife is a clinical psychologist. Let's just Let's just um, draw the distinction here. What What is it that you do? Who are the clients that you usually see? And what are the problems that you're usually helping them solve? Obviously, I know you can't give me the, the details there for confidentiality and privacy reasons, but just give our listeners a little bit of context as to, as to what your day looks like. Well, sure, sure. I'm happy to share a little bit more. More. So um, I am a licensed psychotherapist, and um, that means I'm a mental health clinician. And my area of expertise is what we might call complex relational trauma, or in other words, early developmental trauma, um, and sometimes called complex PTSD. Now, those sound like very overwhelming terms, but one way to think about it is um, I work with high-functioning folks who come from a background of childhood abuse, neglect, sometimes abandonment. Um, you can be very high-functioning and still come from a background like that and have it impact you in your day-to-day -day life. So the folks I work with as a clinician are the people who tend to have everything looking really great on paper, but who have um, really hard feelings going on on the inside. Their inner life does not match the what's on the paper. So that is my work as a clinician, but I also founded and run a boutique therapy center here in the heart of Berkeley, where I have a staff of very highly seasoned, highly trained clinicians, and we treat individuals, couples, families, teens from all over the Bay Area for a wider range of issues. So that's a little bit about me and the work I do in the world. And how did you first become interested in the idea of neuroplasticity and how the words that we say to ourselves and the messages that we give ourselves can uh, can play into neuroplasticity and can impact our overall well-being? How did that first become something that you're interested in? Absolutely. So this has a direct correlation to my clinical work and the type of clients that I do my work with. For folks who come from backgrounds where there's been trauma, neglect, abandonment, or how shall we say, less than supportive upbringings, it's very common for these folks to have internalized um, beliefs and worldviews um, about themselves, about others, and about the world in general that aren't very supportive. So we see this when adults are saying, I'm so fat, I'm so stupid, I'll never find a love, I can't get that promotion, who am I to think that I can buy a house in the Bay Area? These uh, really unkind, unsupportive beliefs are part and parcel of coming from a background like that. And part of the work I'm always interested in doing with my clients well, I'm interested in working at um, issues at all levels, but very much helping them identify what they say. Sometimes they may not even be aware of the things they're saying that are so unkind and so critical about themselves or others, and helping them understand that every time they think this thought or they say it out loud, it reifies the neural groove in their brain and actually helps keep them stuck in that loop. 
So that's part of how I came to neuroplasticity as a subject area. And it's part of the work I do with these clients. Uh, this I could park here for weeks and unpack this stuff. I find this so interesting and so fascinating. But I do want to I do want to define neuroplasticity. So the first the first uh, my introduction to neuroplasticity is my wife was reading a book called The Brain Changes Itself, I believe is what it's called, um, or The Brain Can Change Itself, which is about neuroplasticity. And I first was introduced to the concept uh, through my wife reading the book, and then I attended a conference, a, a WordPress conference, and the keynote speaker was a woman by the name of Kate, whose last name escapes me right now. And she was diagnosed with um, early onset dementia and Alzheimer's at in her early 50s. And so she started using WordPress to blog every day so that she could basically remember her life because short-term memory loss was the thing that was, um, that was impacting her the most. And she, um, the doctors were, her doctors and her whole, her, uh, clinical team were astounded that she was so highly functioning and she attributed her high functioning to the fact that she was just forcing herself to learn new skills every single day and that the her brain was literally forming new neural pathways and that the you know the concept of neuroplasticity was the thing that was keeping her so active so for those uninitiated what exactly is neuroplasticity Well, neuroplasticity, as I define it, refers to this idea that now science has proved that the brain is plastic or, another, in other words, malleable. It's not fixed. And what I mean by it, specifically, I mean the neural pathways in our brains. When neurons fire, they create a neural pathway. That is not static. That is not fixed. Just because your brain um, is a certain way or you think certain thoughts or you have particular habits or beliefs does not mean that those are fixed indefinitely. Plasticity of the brain means that we can essentially create new neural grooves in our brain around habits, thoughts, words we speak, and that the brain can therefore change. In other words, there's a lot of opportunity to change our brain. And when you say neural pathways, and, I, and I, I'm, you know, not a neuroscientist, um, so I'm trying to understand, I'm visualizing neurons in the brain that might transmit and receive messages between each other. And those, those I'm trying to put this in layman's terms for my own benefit, but also for our listeners, that those little messages that get transmitted between transmitters and receivers in the brain are like a little electric pulses that kind of like burn a groove on a record player, if, if, if that makes sense. And that, exactly. and it's like a worn path. The more that we continue sending that message, the more that groove kind of, you know, it gets a little bit deeper and we get kind of stuck in that groove of believing that message. And so what the concept of neuro neuroplasticity is that we can actually form new little grooves by sending new messages between neurons in the brain. Have I kind of got that right in a, in a layman's way? Correct. Absolutely. And to be clear, I'm not a neuroscientist either, but the um, metaphor of the, the record and the mm. grooves is the metaphor I use to illustrate this. Mm. Yes. So the more we do a habit, a behavior, a thought, we create a deeper groove in the record. In order to create a new neural groove, imagine picking up that little, uh, that little spindle, right? The, the yeah. little needle and setting it down elsewhere. Initially, you're not going to create as deep of a groove right away, but if you keep going over that new groove in time and time with repetition, you will create one that is as deep, if not deeper. Now, the other piece I will say to that too, that I think is important, when we create a new habit, a new thought, a new worldview, it does not mean that that former, that old groove remains as deep. It can uh, lessen in intensity over time as we create the new deep groove. I want, to, I want to put this into some kind of very, very practical application for our listeners who might be listening to this saying, well, you know, what's this got to do with anything? Um, the, well, I grew up in the 70s, right? <clears throat> and I grew up in a working class background uh, in the 70s. And the message that I always heard when I was growing up is money doesn't grow on trees. Now, no one's fault that I got that message. It was just that, that that's what my parents 
parents, parents told them, and it just got passed down from generations, right? Now, the irony is, when I grew up in the 70s, money here in Australia was actually made out of paper. It wasn't made out of plastic like it is these days. It was made out of paper. So it actually did grow on trees. We used to chop down trees to make money. <laughs> so, But I, this message that I got growing up was money doesn't grow on trees. So I had, for years, I had this massive... I wasn't even aware of it, but I had this massive scarcity yeah. mindset and thinking around money and the fact that I would never have enough. Yeah. And by me saying I, I, and thinking I will never have enough money actually manifested situations and environments in my life where that was true. I would never have enough money. It took me probably, I reckon, a good seven or eight years of consciously talking to myself out loud using actual verbal words like a mad person uh, uh, to, to kind of reprogram that messaging in my brain. And I remember saying to my wife and my brother, I was talking about this, um, that I feel like there was like 35 years of really bad brainwashing in, in my head. And again, no, no one's fault. I don't blame anyone, but it was just the, that was just the, the way it was. And so it's taken me probably seven or eight years to undo that brainwashing and re-brainwash myself, reform those neural pathways. And now I have a very abundant mindset. Uh, and that it absolutely informs my decisions around money and and has had a huge impact on my entrepreneurial um, journey as well. So I guess the question is, it's it's one thing to say that we can practice these new habits, which we'll talk about in a moment, and we can form new, new neural pathways. But first of all, I suppose you have to be aware that the messages that you're listening to or that you're latching onto are not serving you. How, how, what, what can we do to become more self-aware of the messages that are in our brain and how they might be affecting our behavior? Mm -hmm. It's such a great question. So, um, well, it, and I'm going to say, I want to break this down further. I think there's, there's two parts here. One, there's becoming aware, just period, full stop of what it is you think or you say, even unconsciously. So many of us have these automatic thoughts or these automatic internal messages that just fire off that frankly, we're not consciously paying attention to most of the time. So the first part, our first task was actually uh, to help bring our awareness to what's going on. Now, I am biased as a therapist. I think therapy is incredible and can help mirror back to you maybe what some of those things that are unconscious for you are, but you don't have to be in therapy to start to get in touch with those messages. You can uh, start to track yourself and just pay attention more closely. A lot of people attribute it to that little voice in our head that goes off. Well, that voice is probably talking about things all day long. Just bring a little more awareness there and see what that voice has to say about your body, about money, about your spouse, your partner, your work, etc. Bring your attention there and let's see what turns up. Now, the second piece of this, Troy, is um, becoming aware of how those messages might not be serving you, or in other words, what impact they're having on you. Mm. So every time you get out of the, the shower and you have this thought when you see your body in the mirror, God, my thighs are so big. You have to understand, okay, what is the impact that has then on my emotional landscape, mm. on how then I move through the day or in terms of um, and what kind of love I think I expect or deserve, right? So it's two part, becoming aware of it and then becoming aware of the impact. Mm. And then from there, we get to start transforming some of these thoughts and internal voices. Mm. I'm going to second you and say that therapy has has massively impacted my self-awareness and my ability to get more control over the messages in my head and become really aware of what's going on and how those messages are impacting me and the fact that I can I can have some contribution to changing those messages. Um, big advocate of uh, therapy in I think in Australia there's probably even more stigma around therapy particularly for men um, I, I know that my counterparts in the states kind of almost where having a, a therapist is a bit of a badge of honor um, in Australia there is a lot of stigma around it I, I would like to contribute to that conversation and encourage anyone uh, that you know if, if you have a sore leg you go to the doctor if you have a sore back you go to the physio if something's not quite working out you know uh, right between your ears or you think there's some work that can be done there then definitely see a counselor or a therapist and there is I actually think it's an act of courage and um, I would also reference the uh, the great uh, Brene Brown special uh, A Call to Courage I think it's a fabulous 
fabulous uh, piece of work and it's about an hour and five minutes long and will hopefully change your thinking around all this stuff. So um, putting that aside and um, and encouraging everyone to seek uh, some professional help when they need it or even if they think it would just help them because, I mean, we don't just fix our car when it breaks down. We have it tuned up on a regular basis to keep it running optimally. So, you know, let's pretend that everyone's doing uh, what they should be doing and, and becoming self-aware. What are some of the things that we can then do? And, and we're going to lead into this you know, speaking more kindly to yourself, just talk us through what that means and help us unpack that a bit. <laughs> okay, so I am, I'm going to be frank. Um, this is not rocket science. It is uh, altogether one of the simplest things we could do and also one of the most challenging to change the way we think and talk about ourselves and just in general. Okay, so for me, when I'm working with a client, whether that is in therapy or coaching, and we are working on changing their internal beliefs and, and the way they talk about themselves or anything. Um, first thing we do, we bring awareness to what is actually happening. And then the second part of that, we have them pause. As soon as they notice they're saying that thing that is not constructive, not helpful, we try and create pause after the awareness. And then, and again, this is not rocket science, we substitute a kinder or more supportive thought. And then we rinse and repeat. We do that as many times as we have to in order to get that kinder or more supportive or frankly, just more practical thought to become more automatic than that negative one that just fired off, right? So again, not rocket science, but at the end of the day, I think this is close to Jedi mind tricks as we get. Yeah, it's 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 really difficult because you know, you it, it's it's the, 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 I think the reason I found it so challenging is because by the time, you know, as an adult, by the time you kind of have enough self awareness or enough um, cognitive capacity to realise that uh, I want to have a great life and I I, I want to have a fulfilled life and I want to reach my full potential and there are these stories that I'm listening to in my head that might be holding me back. By the time you become aware of that, there is, you know. 25, 30, 35 years of being stuck in the groove on the record that you, exactly. and, and that, that, that message, it's habitual. You hear that message and you go and eat the ice cream, you know, which, which is the exact opposite thing of what you should be doing, right? Or you go for the chocolate because you, you, you go for the comfort food or you go for the alcohol or the drugs or the promiscuous sex or whatever it is, whatever, or the gambling or whatever it is that, that, that the habit that you're in and it's it's not rocket science, but man, it is it is difficult to pause. It is difficult. The awareness is one thing. It's the pause that takes mm -hmm. enormous discipline, I think, to stop just falling into the habit that has been there for so many years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know, and and you're reminding me one thing that I say to my clients all the time is, look. You know, it took 20, 30, 40 years of you doing things in this one way or speaking to yourself in your in this one way. It will take time to practice something different and to have that become automatic. Now, will it take another 40 years? Probably not, but it will take time. Um, for these reasons, we have these very reflexive, reactive responses um, that we accumulate over time. Um, you're right, Troy. I think the, the hardest part is actually choosing something different in that pause. So I'm going to I want to talk about imposter syndrome which is the kind of common term that we use amongst our audience or that the, the the term that gets used to kind of um, express this feeling of self doubt and that I'm you know I'm not good enough to uh, deliver on this project or I'm not good enough to win this client um, I can't remember who wrote the book, but there, there, there was a book written called um, uh, the, the Imposter Syndrome or something around, I can't remember the author's name, but th that she kind of coined this phrase, the, the Imposter Syndrome, feeling like I'm not good enough to do the thing that I'm promising that I can do. Um, mm. what's, what's some of the, I, I have some ideas that have helped me over the years, but I'm curious as to, as to what you would say to someone who comes to you and says, look, I've got this enormous self-doubt. I put myself out there. I tell clients I can help them. And then as soon as I get close to, uh, to closing a deal, I, I know that I'm sabotaging it. And it's because I don't feel like I deserve it or I don't feel like I'm good enough or I don't feel like they're going to take me seriously and I have this huge self-doubt. 
and I know I'm totally putting you on the spot here, so please forgive me. But what oh, what's okay. in that pause? What's some of the some of the the things that we can do in that in that moment when we pause to try and reframe that thinking? Sure. Well, if if this was a client coming to me with this issue, we we would try and crack this nut from a couple different angles. One, I, I always want to be curious about what that client's history of just general self-esteem is to understand, is this something that impacts only work or does this filter into other aspects of that client's life, right? Mm -hmm. If it's only work-related, I also like to help clients um, develop a more moderate view of their abilities and their track record by identifying times where they actually did succeed or they uh, successfully completed something with their their clients, a project, a, you know, a podcast interview, et cetera. When we have data points in our historical record to call upon in those moments where imposter syndrome is coming up, we can reflect on them and say to ourselves, well, you know, that time I did the project with Joe back in 2017, it actually went really well. Okay, imposter thoughts. Like, I know I can do this and I know those thoughts are there. I'm going to move forward. Now, the other thing I, I want to kind of normalize for a client like this is anytime we stretch ourselves, Troy, whether that is in you know, pitching a big project or asking the person we really, you know, long for on a date, a certain amount of nervousness is normal and natural. We are expanding beyond our known capacities. We are taking a risk. And when there's risk, there will be some uncomfortable feelings involved. So I can't give you one simple answer for this client because I would try and crack the nut from a lot of different ways by asking them questions and getting to know what is it about that situation that's uniquely triggering for them. But in general, calling upon historical data points of times they succeeded and reminding themselves of that, um, challenging unkind thoughts by saying something more supportive that let's say a really good mother or father would have said to their kid, um, having them speak to themselves in that way. Those are some tools, some very concrete tools that I would recommend to anybody. My, one of my, I remember one of my therapists said to me once, let's look at the evidence in front of us. And that was one of those... Yeah. It was, it was, I mean, it sounds so simple, right? But it was one of those, li I'm getting, I'm getting goosebumps remembering it. It was one of those life changing moments where, where it was so simple and so obvious. And I, I asked myself, why am I listening to these stories that other people have put in my head over the years? And why am I refusing to look at the empirical evidence in front of me that tells me I can do the job and I've done it in the past? Uh, it's, it's amazing how powerful those messages that, um, that, that, you know, get in your head uh, are and how they can overrule the evidence in front of you. So I think that's fantastic advice. Um, and I think the other thing is the normalizing is really powerful as well, because everyone I've spoken to on this podcast over the years, and I've spoken to some really incredible, amazing, successful people that you would never think would have imposter syndrome, they have all admitted that at some point they feel like they're out of their depth and they feel like they're going to be found out. It's a really, it's a really normal feeling. Absolutely. And in fact, um, much like the feeling of shame, I would say this, I think the only people who avoid feeling like an imposter uh, are either toddlers or psychopaths. Yes, I think right. for the rest of us, for the rest of us, much like, you know, feeling shame, it's a completely normal and natural human experience. And if you're not feeling it, then I get clinically curious for other reasons. Yeah, that's right. It's funny. We, we ran an event here in Melbourne in October and, uh, my wife works at a clinic uh, here in South Yarra, uh, owned by uh, Dr. Joanne Dennison, and she spoke at our event and she said, let's just talk about this straight off the bat. The only people that don't experience anxiety in any way, shape or form are sociopaths. So uh, as long as there's no sociopaths in the room, then, you know, let's just normalise it. Like, we're, we're, everyone gets anxious. It's a part of the human condition. It's, what, it's, how, we, it's how we manage it. It's what we do with it. And it's how we respond to it that determines whether or not it's uh, debilitating or whether or not we can... I uh, use it as as energy. Hey, I'm curious. You you're an entrepreneur. You're a business owner. Um, how and you've I am. and you've got these skills as a as a psychotherapist and a coach. And you 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 know you're right down this neuroplasticity uh, pathway. And you understand this more than than most of us. What are some of the things that you say to yourself when things get tough in business? Because you know business things get tough all the time. So how do you, how, how does a coach coach themselves through the hard days? I'm curious. 
I love that. In in my entire history of being interviewed, nobody's ever asked me that. But yeah, yeah, doubts come up a lot, right? Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. I'm in this phase of my life where um, I just had a child a year ago, so I'm a brand new mother. Congratulations! Just launched this center. I've got. Thank you. I've got five staff members. So it's been a, a year of massive growth, right? This has all happened in the last year. And along with that growth has come a, a lot of doubt, uh, a, a lot of insecurity, a lot of questioning, right? And so um, how do I coach myself around this? Well, I think, first of all, reminding myself that, hey, I've never done these things before. Of course, you're going to be anxious. Of course, it's going to feel uncomfortable. You're stepping into new territory. You're growing new muscles. So I always remind myself of that. Um, you're meant to be a little uncomfortable right now. And um, the other mm -hmm. thing I remind myself is that, um, well, there's a couple different things. Uh, I remind myself of what I've been able to accomplish to date. And, you know, I show I have a track record of having been able to accomplish anything I've set my mind to. Mm. So I keep reminding myself of that. And then the other thing I, I work with uh, with myself around is seeking out help. If I'm struggling, if I don't know the answer, that's fine. There are other people who are coaches around that exact issue or who have grown group practices or who know how to get their kid into good you know, preschools in the Bay Area. I can turn towards other people for support. Mm. So I take care of myself, yes, by normalizing my experience, by reflecting on my own track record. But then I get actionable and I look for help in the ways that, you know, I might need. Um and that's, there's nothing really fancy to it. I just keep mm. putting one foot in front of the other and I get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. I love that. Comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think is, um, we, I have a two year old and we have another one on the way, uh, due in April. Oh, um, oh congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, they, as you know, they completely change your life. Uh, and it's a very different experience for mums and dads. Uh, I, I, I know, um, um, my wife, it's been, you know, extremely physically and, and, and emotionally much more taxing on her than it was on me, particularly in the first three to three to six months of Oscar's life. But I remember when he was born, the first couple of weeks I was just reflecting on how can I be the most use to this little creature? You know, what are the, and I was thinking like, what are the, what are the big key lessons that I want to teach him over his life? And really it came down to two things. I want to teach him to be resilient. I want to teach him to be able to uh, be uncomfortable uh, to to be comfortable in the in the awkwardness and the unknown and life is full of unknowns and life is full of um, uncertainty and I want to be able I want to teach him to be resilient in the face of uncertainty and resourcefulness is the other key thing that I want to teach him I want to teach yes. him how to learn I want to teach him how to figure things out for himself um, uh, so that that mm -hmm. totally resonates with me now I I also in my research I also came across a great study out of the University of Michigan by a gentleman by the name of Ethan Cross who is professor in the psychology department there and he and his colleagues did a research around this um, the, the fact that actually not only not only talking to yourself um, can impact your your results and your beliefs but actually talking to yourself out aloud, and, and more specifically, but mm. actually talking to yourself out loud in the third person was uh, they did this uh, they did this control wow. study with some basketball players and they instructed some of the basketball players to actually talk to themselves out aloud in the third person and say things like, come on, Troy, you can do this, you can make this shot, you've got this, Troy, it's all yours, you've got it. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And the results were astounding with the group that's, that talked to themselves out aloud in the third person and the control group that didn't. Uh, talk to themselves at all. I wonder, do you talk to yourself out aloud or is it just in your head that you're actually giving yourself these these messages and this coaching? Absolutely both. <laughs> Probably one more frequently in my house when I'm I'm home alone away from the public eye. But absolutely, I, I think I was, uh, I even caught myself this morning struggling during my morning workout. And I, I think I said to myself, come on, Annie, you've got it. And you just keep going, honey, you know, something like that. But I literally said that out loud yeah. in my garage at five o'clock in the morning working out. So yes, I, I do both. Yeah. Love it. Great. I'm not the only one. I do it all the time. I'm that guy. No. I'm that I'm that guy in the supermarket no. looking at all the different types of nappies and wipes going, come on, Troy, you can do this. You've got it. You can pick the right one. <laughs> People walking past me going, hey, that guy's talking to himself. Uh, yeah. 
but at, at least at least it's a at least it's a kind conversation. I remember years ago I was on set and I was doing some sound recording work and I was packing up the the gear and I was trying to figure out how to roll all the cables up and I'd hired this kit off a friend of mine to do this and I was trying to pack it all up neatly for him and I was getting a little bit flustered. And my friend was behind me and she was packing up the auto cue on the teleprompter. And I just said to myself, I said, come on, Troy, you can do this. You've done it before. And I just said it under my breath. And she said from behind me, she said, oh, my gosh, you are so kind to yourself. I said, well, yeah, it's taken me a long time to get here. Only a couple of years ago, I would have just been, you know, just giving myself a real hard time and abusing myself. But I figured I've just realized that that actually doesn't help. It doesn't help me get the thing done any quicker. And it just makes me feel worse. So, um I'm just going to be kind to myself from now on. Hey, this has been a super, super fascinating conversation. Where can people reach out and find more about Annie Wright and uh, and your work and get in touch and say thank you for this uh, this interview? Oh, well, um, they can find me uh, on the web at www.anniewrightpsychotherapy.com. You can find all of my writing. I've been writing for about four years. And you can also learn more about my psychoeducational digital products and also learn more about the therapy center I run there. Um, and, uh, you know, if somebody is, one of your listeners is in the Bay Area or California in general, and they're looking for support, would love to be able to be of support to them. Awesome. What's the uh, final question is, what's the one thing about being an entrepreneur and having your own gig that's keeping you awake at night these days? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I've got some pretty big uh, financial goals and staff goals and clinical goals for 2020. I was just putting together my strategic vision and I was wondering, goodness gracious, how can I balance this with the weeks that my nanny needs to take vacation and the <laughs> childcare drop off hours? So now <laughs> the things that keep me awake at night are reconciling business with the reality of being a new mom, <laughs> just trying to make all the dots line up. Yep. Um, but it's a, it's a joy. I would not have it any other way. Yeah. Awesome. I hear you. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to join us on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I love the fact that we've connected through an article that you wrote on the web that I found in a Google search. So good old fashioned content marketing and sharing your thoughts online is a fabulous thing. So thank you for doing that and keep up all the great work. Oh, thank you so much for having me on today, Troy. It's been a delight speaking with you. Thanks, Annie. All right, gang, there you go. There's another episode of the WP Elevation podcast. Uh, please hit us up over at iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you follow us and uh, keep in touch on Facebook and YouTube as well. We'd love to hear your comments, feedback and thoughts. Uh, feel free to leave a comment under this video. You can find it at wpelevation.com. Just go to the podcast section and look for the episode with Annie Wright. I look forward to speaking with you again next week on the podcast. Until then, I'm Troy Dean. Go Elevate.